When the RTX 4090 was launched last year and reviews for this card hit the web, a lot of comparisons I had seen of this GPU were against the RTX 3090 Ti. The reason for this is because the 4090 right now is the fastest GPU in the Ada Lovelace family, and the RTX 3090 Ti was the fastest from the Ampere lineup. However, I look at the 4090 as a more direct replacement to the RTX 3090, and since I own both of these GPUs, I decided I'd do a head-to-head -head comparison in 42 games. Let's get into it. Hey, if you enjoy content like this, drop a like, make sure to subscribe, and smash that bell so you never miss another video. Hey, what is going on guys? Danny here. Welcome back to the channel and I hope you've all been doing well. Today we're going to be taking a look at a head-to-head -head showdown between the RTX 4090 and RTX 3090. I wanted to do this comparison for a few reasons. The first reason was that when I had initially reviewed my RTX 4090, I was still using a Ryzen 7 5800X in my test bench. If you had seen my test bench update video where I benchmarked the 13700K, Against the 5800X, there was a significant difference in performance across many titles, even at 4K. Therefore, I did end up holding back the 4090 in that video and didn't show its full potential, and due to that, couldn't show a better comparison between the different GPUs. Another reason why I decided to do this comparison is because I see the 4090 as being a more direct successor to the 3090 rather than the 3090 Ti. If and when Nvidia releases the RTX 4090 Ti, that is the card I will consider to be the true successor to the 3090 Ti. But I get why reviewers had more often compared the 4090 to the 3090 Ti as it was the fastest card from the previous generation and the 4090 is currently the fastest we have from the 40 series. Both the 3090 and 4090 are cut down versions of the 102 dies from their generation, so I find them to be more closely related in that sense as well. I also benchmarked 42 games, whereas in my initial review, I benchmarked just 12 games. This should give us a lot more data to work with and see which games the 4090 has a larger performance advantage in and which games it doesn't. Also, around the time I posted my review, Nvidia came out with a new driver, 522.25, where they claimed significant performance improvements for the RTX 30 series and DX12 titles. Since I had already completed my testing and was in the process of posting that review, I couldn't include the updated results for my 3090, so this allows us to go back and take a look at some of those titles as well. And finally, there hasn't been a lot going on in the PC tech world, so I was bored and decided, hey, I'll just benchmark a bunch of games and see what the results are like, and there are many new titles I've been wanting to test as well, so we'll get a chance to take a look at those. With that said, let's move on to the test system specifications. For the CPU, we have an Intel Core i7-13700K, which I have overclocked its P-cores to 5.5GHz, E-cores are running at 4.5GHz, and the ring has been overclocked to 4.9GHz. It's also cooled by an Arctic Liquid Freezer 2360 AIO. The CPU is paired with 32GB of Patriot Viper Venom, RGB, DDR5 memory, which I've overclocked to 6800 mega transfers, with tuned CL34 manual timings. For the motherboard, we have an MSI Z790 Carbon Wi-Fi. The RTX 4090 I'll be using in this video is the MSI Gaming X Trio version, which has been overclocked. It's got a 205 MHz offset to its core, allowing it to run comfortably at around 3 GHz, and its memory has been overclocked to 24 gigabits per second. The RTX 3090 is the ASUS ROG Strix model, which I've also overclocked, and it runs at around 2 GHz and has its memory running at 20 gigabits per second. For the storage, we've got a 4TB Corsair MP600 Pro Gen and for NVMe. Powering these components is an EVGA 1000G Theory power supply. The operating system we'll be testing with is Windows 11 Pro, and for the drivers, I'm using NVIDIA's 528.49 package. I wanted to also go over how I benchmarked these games. I tested all these games at 4K and I enabled ray tracing and DLSS in games where it was available. These GPUs were released at $1,500 plus, and people in this segment aren't going to be gaming at 1080p with this kind of hardware. 1440p high refresh, probably, but I just wanted to test at the most GPU-bound resolution. Along with that, people in this segment will probably be interested in taking advantage of those high-fidelity features, like ray tracing, so this gives us a more complete picture rather than having to separate rasterization testing and then ray tracing with DLSS testing. Alright, so with all of that out of the way, it's time we jumped into these gaming 
benchmarks, and starting us off is Hogwarts Legacy. At 4K with ray tracing turned on and DLSS set at quality, we see both GPUs not putting up the greatest numbers here. The 4090 was better, but I wouldn't call it much smoother. What I will say about Hogwarts Legacy is that it's a game that seems more demanding than it looks. Sure, it looks good, but it's nothing earth shattering. Still, if you wanted to play this game completely maxed out with ray tracing, then the 4090 is the way to go. You'll be looking at 51% better average FPS figures and 44% for the 1% lows. Moving on, and we have A Plague Tale Requiem. Now this game shows us a totally different story, and I think it looks just as good, if not better, than Hogwarts Legacy. In this title, with ray tracing and DLSS set to quality, the RTX 4090 attains an average FPS of 112 and 97 for its 1% lows, making it a whopping 123% and 125% faster respectively. That is a massive difference, and the overall gameplay was a lot better on the 4090, and for anyone wondering, frame generation wasn't enabled, but if you did want to make the game appear smoother for yourself, you can enable that, but honestly, it's not needed. Up next, we have Marvel's Spider-Man Remastered. We can see here that the RTX 4090 still provides us with some decent gains over the RTX 3090. You can expect an improvement of around 46% for the average FPS and 52% for the 1% lows. With that said, performance from the 3090 isn't bad either, and with a few compromises to settings, you can increase your frame rate so it'll be fairly smooth. Moving on, and we have Atomic Heart, and this game is interesting. It was the poster child for ray tracing back in 2018, but has released with no ray tracing features that the player can turn on, so that's quite bizarre if you ask me. I hear it's going to come later as an update, but there's no word on that specifically. Specifically. Still, for a game released in 2023, it looks pretty decent. As for performance, both GPUs offer pretty good performance. The 3090 attains an average FPS of 78 and 68 for the 1% lows, which is still quite respectable, but the 4090 does improve on that by a considerable margin. We're looking at 46% improvement towards the average FPS and 44% for the 1% lows. Returnal is another new title on the list, and performance in this game is pretty important as it's a fast paced third person roguelike shooter, and the 4090 sure does deliver here. With epic quality settings, ray tracing on epic, and DLSS set to quality, the 4090 attains an average FPS of 140 and the 1% lows are at 102. That makes it 73% faster when it comes to the average FPS and is 76% faster for the 1% lows, so it's a great showing for the Ada Lovelace GPU. In Microsoft Flight Simulator, while both GPUs offer pretty good performance, the difference between them isn't that large, but this is because this title is quite CPU limited. The performance improvement you can expect going from an RTX 3090 to a 4090 is just 20% for the average FPS, and that margin is also the same when it comes to the 1% lows. This is a game that I think would be the best candidate for you to use frame generation in. It's not very fast paced and doesn't require a lot of quick inputs from the user. So if, if all you're after is just a smoother picture, then I would recommend enabling it. It's just a shame that the 3090 misses out on that feature as well. Total War Warhammer 3 is a game that I wanted to revisit. This was a game that I did show in my initial review, and the reason why I wanted to show this to you guys is because we do see performance has changed. Not so much for the 3090, but it has for the 4090, and as I had explained, using a 5800X in my initial review didn't allow the 4090 to fully stretch its legs. Now we're looking at 82% better average FPS, and 91% for the 1% lows. Performance was already pretty good to begin with for the 4090 in this title at 4K, but with the 13700K, we see it's even better. Forza Horizon 5 is another title that I wanted to revisit. This game has since added ray tracing with its update, but only for the player's car, and I believe there were a couple of other settings added as well. Performance hasn't really changed too much though, and we're still looking at the same sort of margins here. 76% for the average FPS and 60% for the 1% lows, allowing the 4090 to provide the smoothest gameplay in this title. F1 2022 is another racing title in our benchmark suite, and here the situation is similar. The 4090 is just in another league, offering 87% better performance for the average FPS, and is 65% better when it comes to the 1% lows. Again, performance with the 3090 isn't bad, but if you want to be able to enjoy the smoothest gameplay with everything maxed out, ray tracing turned on, then the 4090 is the way to go. Hitman 3 is next, and it's another title I wanted to revisit, this time with ray tracing and DLSS enabled. The 4090 in this game is 85% faster than the 3090 when it comes to the average FPS, and is also 74% faster for the 1% lows. 
The Rift Breaker is an interesting title. We have ray tracing enabled in this game but no upscaling, and we can see both GPUs offering great performance even at 4K. I was however surprised to see how performance scaled in this title with GPUs. At first glance, you'd think it's a CPU bound game, but jumping from the 3090 to the 4090, we see average FPS jump by 90% and then 93% for the 1% lows. That is quite the jump in performance. Shadow of the Tomb Raider probably needs an update, but the game still looks great and scales well off of hardware. In this title, the 4090 is basically offering double the performance versus the 3090. Not much else needs to be said here. Bright Memory Infinite is a game that I haven't tested in a while. It's a pretty cool first person shooter if you haven't checked it out, and was also recently updated with DLSS 3 support, though for my testing I didn't use frame generation. Still, we're seeing a very large performance gap between the two GPUs, with the 4090 attaining 93% better average frame rate and 94% for the 1% lows. Metro Exodus Enhanced Edition is a title which has ray tracing turned on by default, so I'm not surprised to see just how much better the 4090 is in this title when compared to the 3090. When it comes to the average FPS, it's a whopping 103% faster and offers 74% better 1% lows. While this isn't a competitive FPS shooter, you're still going to have a much better time with the 4090 when it comes to 4K gaming in this title. Moving on, and we have some competitive FPS titles we're taking a look at, starting with Halo Infinite. The 4090 has no trouble at all delivering triple digit performance in this title at 4K with ultra settings. It leads the 3090 by 90% for the average FPS and 70% for the 1% lows, making it much more suited for high refresh gaming. In Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 2022, we see a similar story, and this is with normal slash competitive settings, just much better performance at 4K in this title from the 4090 when compared to the RTX 3090, and while the improvement to the average FPS has been in line with what we've seen from previous titles, it's the 1% lows which are very eye-opening. I'm not sure why, but at 4K, the 3090's 1% low figures just get decimated. They take a pretty large hit. The 4090 is offering nearly triple the performance in this area, making it a lot more smooth and better suited for competitive gaming in a fast-paced title like this. It's so crucial to have that. Next up, we have Apex Legends, and the 4090 was basically capped out at the 300 FPS limit of this game, so we don't know how it truly performs in this title. The 3090 attained an average FPS of 162 and 141 for the 1% lows, which is totally acceptable and what I would consider to be quite smooth. The Witcher 3 with this next-gen update on ultra settings and ray tracing enabled is very demanding, and we can clearly see that here. The RTX 4090 does offer a much better experience, but still some tweaking would be needed to smooth out its performance. This is a title where I also wouldn't mind enabling frame generation. Basically any single player game I would deem it's fine, if what you're after are the highest fidelity visuals and a smoother picture. As for performance, it's 79% faster with its average FPS and 85% for the 1% lows. For the 3090, you'd have to lower many settings and perhaps avoid ray tracing altogether if you plan on playing this game at 4K that is. The Division 2 is an older Ubisoft title, but they had some big updates recently and I saw it had a resurgence in its player base, so I thought I might as well include it in my testing. Both GPUs offer a playable experience in this title at 4K, but if you're after high refresh performance, then the 4090 will easily offer that to you. It offers 87% faster average FPS and 88% for the 1% lows. The last game we'll be taking a look at is Watch Dogs Legion with ray tracing enabled and DLSS set to quality. The RTX 4090 attains an average FPS of 106, making it 80% faster than the 3090, offering a much more smoother experience. Moving on, let's take a look at our 42 game average. When it comes to the average FPS, the RTX 4090 is 64% faster than the 3090, and if we were to go back and take a look at my 12 game average from my initial review of this GPU, the margin then was 61%, though granted, I wasn't using as fast of a CPU and the cards were at stock condition. 1% lows however see a much better improvement, we're seeing around 65% greater performance going from a 3090 to a 4090 in this area. In my initial review that margin was at 44% so not nearly as big. I'm assuming the 13700K is also a major contributing factor there too. While at 4K your GPU bound and a faster CPU probably won't increase your average FPS drastically, it can still help immensely with 1% lows and consistency with your frame times. 
Our game by game chart gives us a much better outlook on the overall performance. There were lots of titles which showed a performance advantage of at least 70% greater average FPS, and at 4K, that is a massive difference in this demanding resolution. In the vast majority of titles, the 4090 offered triple digit performance, and this is with nearly everything maxed out. While the 3090 is a capable GPU at 4K, there are certainly lots of titles where it will deliver a playable experience. If you're someone like me who has a 4K OLED and you want to be able to enjoy your modern AAA games at smooth 120Hz, then the 4090 is hands down the best GPU to fulfill that role. This is also why the 4090 is looked at in a much better light when compared to the other RTX 40 series GPUs because relative to where the previous generation model was, you are getting a significant boost in performance gen on gen. Remember, the 3090 launched at 1499 and the 4090 has an MSRP of 1599. And also because it's the best GPU, then, you know, people also overlook the higher pricing. However, one thing you do have to keep in mind is that the 3090 had launched with grossly inflated MSRP. In my initial review, it was barely faster than my 3080, and in my 4090 review, that was also the same case. Given its lackluster gaming performance compared to the 3080, it really should not have been more than 899 or 999, but because you got 24 gigabytes of VRAM, and also because Nvidia said this GPU would be good for workstation users, which, you know, is a valid point. Point, they gave it a higher price tag. It just didn't make any sense from a gaming perspective. With the 40 series, this isn't necessarily the same case because the 4090 is a lot faster than the 4080, and the 4080 is now what's grossly inflated compared to last gen. Had the RTX 4080 come out at 799, then I would have been recommending people buy that card and, you know, forget about the 4090, it's just not worth it. Circling back to the 3090, we also have to take a look at where things stand today. You most likely won't be able to buy a 3090 brand new anymore, so you'll have to look at the used market for one, and doing a quick search for 3090s on eBay, prices aren't so bad. I was seeing 3090 listings anywhere from $700 to $800 US, so if you compare that to what new 4090s are going for, then the discussion becomes a lot more interesting. Most AIB models for the 4090 are double the price of what used 3090s are going for, so you have to ask yourself if paying double the price is justifiable for you. I'm not going to give you an answer on that because as I've mentioned in the past, it really just comes down to your own personal needs. No one else can really tell you based on, you know, your own needs what you have to do. If you want the best 4K gaming experience, then it's justifiable. If you're gaming at 1440p most of the time, then probably not. With the used market, there are risks, but that's basically a given. As a new alternative, you can go for a 4070 Ti, which goes for around the same price as what these used 3090s are going for. However, you do lose half the VRAM, as it only comes with 12GB of G6X, and its memory bus is much slimmer, therefore it has less bandwidth, and that can be a uh, problem at 4K. So, I mean... Compared to used 3090 prices, I feel like the 4070 Ti just isn't that great of a deal. I think we'll leave it at that. This was a piece of content that I had been wanting to make for quite some time now. Actually, since I got my 4090, but just didn't have the time to do all this testing since there was a lot of other things happening at the time. I also wanted to um, update my test bench and there were new releases to talk about too. But since then, things have died down. So this gave me the perfect chance to make this video. And in some ways, I'm glad I did wait because it gave me the opportunity to look at newly released titles like Hogwarts Legacy, Atomic Heart, and uh, Returnal. So if you, any of you were out there wondering how these two graphics cards perform head-to-head -head in a wide variety of titles, hope this video helped you. If you know anyone else who might benefit from this info, please share it to them. That'll be very much appreciated. I'll catch you guys in the next one. If you guys found this video to be informative and entertaining, then leave a like. Let me know your thoughts and comments down below. Be sure to check out the video description for cool links and ways to support the channel, such as using my Amazon affiliate link. And if you're interested in seeing more content like this, then consider subscribing, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for watching, take care and I'll see you in the next one.